Well, good evening and thanks for joining us here on News 20. I'm Randy Gardner. We've got a great show for you tonight. We have Dan Fox from the American Red Cross. Glad you could join us. We appreciate your time. Of course. Thank you for having me. And to your right, we have Judy Weidman. Glad you could join us. We'll talk thank about you. your story in a few minutes, but it's, uh, it's fascinating, as we talked about it before we went on the air here. Dan, as uh, summer kind of comes to a close here, we enter the fall and winter seasons. How did the summer go since the last time we had you on? Uh, we've had better and we've had worse, but uh, first and foremost, the Red Cross and, and on behalf of the American Red Cross and the hospitals we serve here in the Missouri, Illinois region, just want to thank everybody who did come out and donate blood this summer. Um, for any of your viewers or anybody who's been out and about, they probably heard that uh, blood donations did take a tumble in the month of July, and that's certainly true. Uh, the good news is that as we, uh, as we enter the end of August, we get ready to start that fall. Our donations have rebounded a bit. We're not completely out of the woods yet, though, so we certainly want to encourage everyone who uh, is eligible to donate to please come out and do so so that we can ensure that our supplies remain stable going into those fall months. Now, is this something you see periodically or yearly when a donation level will go down in specific parts of the year? Uh, it's usually during the summer months, and that could be for, uh, for a number of different reasons. Uh, first and foremost, typically because schools are out of session, which is great for the students, not so great for the American Red Cross when it comes to collecting blood. Uh, when you figure that uh, year-round, about 20% of the blood the Red Cross collects comes from blood drives held at high schools, colleges, universities. You can understand why the summer months can be so difficult because that's a large chunk of blood donors and blood donations that we're not getting. Uh, in addition to that, uh, a lot of families are planning their summer vacations, obviously, during the summer. They're planning trips uh, and they're not putting blood donations at the top of their priority list. Also, again, any of your viewers know, especially here in the Midwest, here in Missouri, in Illinois, in, in Kansas, where, where are you, uh, where have you, uh, we can get some very hot days and not just one or two hot days but sustained uh, days of triple digit temperatures or, or uh, heat indices very high when it gets that hot nobody really wants to leave their air-conditioned home or office to do much of anything including again donating blood and so all of those factors can play a role in keeping donations down we typically do see that during the summer months uh, and so we are we are certainly thankful that fall is right around the corner again students may not be excited that school is starting up again but we certainly are what about usage of blood though is that kind of periodic too is it heavier during the summer because more people are more active there's more accidents things like that it certainly can be you know we and, and that just kind of ebbs and flows throughout the year but uh, certainly if you do have more people out on the roads uh, car accident victims are among those that can receive blood products and often do receive blood products but uh, car accident victims aren't the only ones uh, certainly we also have uh, cancer patients some of whom re uh, require daily blood transfusions uh, you have people undergoing surgery uh, something that Judy can speak to in, in just a few minutes uh, you have uh, women giving birth to babies you have uh, our premature babies in, in addition uh, so it could be any number of hospital patients in fact one out of every ten patients admitted to the hospital will end up receiving a blood product a blood transfusion of some sort and so uh, again when you figure when you look at that number that's that's ten percent of the people entering the hospital uh, that's a very large number and that and that can happen uh, any time during the year and can and does happen every day. After the last time we had you on, I sat back and thought of some great questions I should have asked you <laughs> while you were on last time. So I've got them down for this time, but we're going to focus on Judy now, Judy Weidman. Um, talk to us about uh, what happened to you two years ago. Well, two years ago, I had the good fortune of uh, being notified. I called by St. Louis University. They said, hey, we got a liver for you, and I was able to receive a liver transplant. What I really, after the whole process, I have such respect for the American Red Cross, people who, who give blood, because yes, in fact, I did have a liver donated, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, but after three days in surgery, I w received 38 units of blood, which there was, they were constantly refilling my body. It was like, they, tell, they told me it was four times the amount of blood that a human body needs. And I think I just realized that I was overwhelmed with the thought that the surgery wouldn't have meant anything if I couldn't have had the blood. So I have an enormous respect for America, the American Red Cross and, and the work that they do. Now, were you a blood donor before this? Before I was. I, I can't be now. So you understood yes. the importance of this. And then you kind I of reaped the I benefits. Don't I don't think I understood the poor. I just thought it was a, something that you should do. And so I did it. But it, until I had my personal experience 
where I, I came out of surgery and I was told that I had all this blood, I thought, my gosh, you know, so many surgeries would not be successful. They wouldn't work if there wasn't that blood available to people. So many people, and Dan and I talk about this, whether it's giving blood, whether it's just going to your doctor for a routine exam, are so afraid of, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna pass out, I'm gonna die in the chair giving blood or whatever. It's really painless. It's very, very simple process. What would you say to the people out there who are watching tonight? Go, well, it sounds great, but I'm still afraid. I guess I would have to say that you never know what your future for yourself or your family might be. I never dreamed that I would ever be a person that would have a liver transplant. And uh, you just never know what your needs will be. And so I think it's just a community thing, uh, caring about one another, caring about what's going on, to try to do that if you can donate, be a, a, a donator of blood. I'm, I'm so grateful to 38 people uh, thought enough uh, to donate blood. I have 38 people to thank. <laughs> when, uh, Dan, you put this into perspective, and a lot of times when people think about it in perspective, they really start to rethink the way that they've been processed to, to think in the past. But on a daily or weekly basis, how much blood and how many people need to donate just to keep the cycle going? Oh, that's a fantastic question, and if you want to localize, localize it as much as we can, here in the Missouri-Illinois region, which is where we're located here, uh, we serve close to 80 hospitals. Uh, every day, the Red Cross here in this region needs to collect about 800 blood products, and that's to keep up with the demand from hospitals. Uh, across the country, uh, somebody's going to need blood roughly every two seconds. Uh, so that just kind of gives you an idea of how often it's needed. And the other thing that uh, I think sometimes people take, or f take for granted or they, they don't necessarily think about is that uh, blood isn't something that can be manufactured. It's not something that we can make in a lab. It's not something that we can get from anyone else other than voluntary blood donors. People coming in, uh, taking an hour or so out of their day, doing it not because they're getting paid, doing it not uh, necessarily because they're going to get recognition. Unfortunately, uh, more of our donors don't get recognized for the heroic uh, deeds that they do, but uh, they do it simply because they know it's the right thing to do. They do it because they know people like Judy and others are going to need this. Maybe not right now, but they're going to need it someday. Uh, and if it weren't for those uh, those selfless acts, those donors, uh, we wouldn't have blood at all. And um, you know, it's scary to say, but I know that that Judy said it before. She might not be here if it weren't for those donors. When you look at the statement you made, 800 blood products. Is that 800 people in St. Louis that needs to donate a day? to fulfill those 800 blood sure. products, that's or is another. it multiple people to fill just one? Right, that's another fantastic question. And actually, one blood donation can help save up to three lives. And, and the reason we're able to do that is because when you donate uh, one pint of whole blood, which is typically what you donate at any of our blood drives or any of our donation centers, we're able to break that blood into different uh, components, uh, plasma, platelets, red blood cells. And I understand that that's maybe over the head of some of uh, some of your viewers. It's, it's over my head a lot of the times too. Um, but because we're able to break down uh, those products into different components, we're able to service different people. And so it's not necessarily 800 donors that need to come through, but we need to make, we need to make sure that we've got about 800 blood products. Now saying that, saying that we don't necessarily need 800 donors, doesn't mean we want anybody to take the day off and say, oh, they don't need me today because uh, because trust me, your blood will be needed. As far as pints, how many pints are in your body? And if you, they take one, it's like the oil, are you low for a while? And how do you rebuild that back up? That's essentially it. Usually the, <laughs> usually the human body has about 10 to 12 pints. And I think last time we were here, we had used that car, uh, the, the, the car, um, imagery as well, and, and actually, it's a good uh, it's a good metaphor. But uh, you typically have about ten to twelve pints of blood, and so when you donate one pint, uh, you will notice that some people, as you mentioned, uh, fainting. Some people do have kind of a reaction. You might feel a little lightheaded. That's because you just lost a pint of your blood. Um, but well, one pint of your blood is not going to make or break you. Um, typically, uh, all the time after you donate blood, you'll be offered uh, free refreshments, uh, water, juice, cookies. Um, that's to kind of get your uh, get your body back up to speed just a little bit. But then over the course of the next few days and next few weeks, your body will produce another pint and you'll be okay. Um, so that's why uh, if you've ever donated blood uh, before,
before, you know that you can't go out and donate blood again tomorrow. You have to wait 56 days, or roughly six weeks, uh, before you can donate again. And that six-week period is just giving your body a chance to recuperate. And shelf life of blood. People will say, well, you know, I'll donate next week. I'll donate the following week. And then you get busy with the family. You get busy with work, and you don't do it. And then you don't meet your goals of needing getting the people that you need. As far as a shelf life on blood, does it last for weeks or once you get it it's processed and shipped out uh, it can last on our shelves for 42 days which is a little over a month however a uh, little secret it very rarely lasts that long in fact it very rarely lasts more than a few days there were times I told you that uh, the month of July especially was uh, was a tough one for the American Red Cross there were times in July where the blood wasn't even sitting on the shelf for a full day before it was going out to a hospital and going to a patient in need typically that blood if it's going to sit on the shelf at all is only going to be there for a couple of days before it's needed does this, when you hear what we're talking about here, does this put into perspective and maybe scare you a little bit it's that terrifying. you could have had your <laughs> well, operation and the right. blood could have not been there? You, when you're going through something like that, you're so focused on getting a call that you're going to get a liver and, and the whole process, and so, but you don't think of the other additives. And it is terrifying to think that you would be able to get a liver, but you would get, get into harm's way and there wouldn't be resources to get blood to you. Do you find that it's a multitude of people who do it, or do you have percentage numbers, or is it the same people who consistently come back every 60 days to give blood? We do see a lot of uh, what we call regular blood donors or repeat donors. These are the people who are there every 56 days or every six weeks, every two months, what have you. Uh, they come out to our blood drives every opportunity they get to give blood because it's, it's one of those things where I think once people do it once or twice, they get over that fear that they might have had or they, they kind of realize that their preconceived notions about blood donors, uh, blood donation were, were maybe a little off. Once they realize, um, you know, that it's it's really not bad. It's not painful. Uh, they want to do it again, and and you know we're very fortunate that people like Judy have agreed to have agreed to talk to other groups and have agreed to uh, talk to your viewers tonight and and kind of inform them about what's going on because when people hear it from a recipient, they hear it from somebody who was there. I think that kind of it really uh, sends the message home that what they're doing is making a difference. Um, and so we see a lot of donors once they do it once or once they do it twice, they say. This is something I want to keep doing. This is something I want to make part of a regular habit. But on the same side, uh, we do get a lot of new blood donors as well. Uh, we had mentioned uh, just a moment ago about high schools and colleges, school, uh, school blood drives and school age students. That's where a lot of our donors start. And maybe they start donating because it gets them out of class. That's fine. But uh, <laughs> either way, either way, they're starting the donation process. Either way, they're starting it and they're realizing again that uh, it's not painful, that it doesn't take a long time. Um, and they realize again the, these notions they may have had may have been incorrect and they can then tell their friends and tell their family members hey I donated blood today if you haven't done so maybe it's something you want to try too. When you look at uh, your surgery and this is completely confidential nobody knows where the blood's going where your blood came from but what would you say to those individuals that oh. participated oh my God. in making yeah. you know your, your life livable? Well it uh there's no words that can express the gratitude that, that I have for the, you know, I'm, I'm living a very healthy life. I'm very normal. I mean, I, I work every day. I've, I'm back to being the person I was. And if I could, I would love to thank each one of them. You know, it's like you realize there's no other place to get blood but from donors. So it's not something that can be developed in, in, a, in a laboratory or something. And you realize that you, meaning me, uh, I was fortunate. I, I, I sometimes I use, I, when I was in the hospital cell, I'd, I'd lay there and I'd think, what would have happened if I'd had the liver, but I never could get the blood that kept me going for the three days? Um, and that's essentially what happened. I had a three-day operation with new blood pumping through me constantly, which had to happen in order to get everything worked out. <laughs> When you tell your story, not on television like this, where you can't see a reaction from the crowd imme immediately, but when you tell this in front of a, a group or to friends, what's their look on their face? Can you see that well, look of amazement in their face? My really close friends know the time, but most people are kind of like awestruck. They don't think a, a surgery could take three days. I was in the, the surgery three days. 
Matter of fact, I have spoken a couple for, times for St. Louis University. Doctors have come up to me and said, oh, I, I, was in, I was in the operating room. And, you know, it's like they think I would remember them and I have no clue. But, you know, there were a lot of people in that operating room taking care of me. And uh, the blood was just an integral part. And I can't express to people enough. You know, you don't think you're going to be the guy. You're gonna, you don't think you're going to be the person that's going to need it. And going into the surgery, all I could think is, oh, my God, life is good. I've gotten a liver. Coming back out of it, I realized that it wouldn't work without the blood. Can you use your own blood if you're going to have an operation? Can you bank it? Can you store it to make sure that your blood goes back in your body? Not that it makes a difference, but that's a fantastic question. Actually, sometimes it can make a difference, and certainly if it's a if it's a surgery that you know you're going to have, it's it's not an emergency surgery, but something that you're scheduled. Uh, sometimes your doctor will advise you to donate a pint or two pints of your blood, depending on on how far out it is, uh, just to make sure that they have some of your own blood there. And uh, the reason being is, um, you know, everybody has a certain blood type. It's A or B or O or what have you. And uh, you really can't a lot of times mix and match those blood types. You need to make sure that the blood that you're receiving is the same type that you have. Uh, and so to, in order to make sure that that's the case, uh, sometimes your doctor will uh, suggest that you donate your own blood ahead of time so that it can go to you during a surgery. And uh, while we're talking about those blood types, I do want to mention that there's one type in particular, uh, O negative blood. And if any of your viewers uh, have O negative blood, then I'm talking to them um, as much as anybody else. Donate blood if you have O negative blood because that is the universal blood type, meaning it can be given to anybody. It doesn't matter what that person's blood type is. If they're getting O negative, their body can accept it. And O negative blood is the type that's used most often in emergency situations. When they don't have time to determine a patient's blood type, they'll use O negative because they know that person can receive it without complications. But otherwise, um, again, you can't mix and match the blood types you receive. And so sometimes your doctor will advise you to donate blood prior to your surgery to make sure you have some on hand. How many people out there do you find that have no idea what their blood type is? And I'm almost embarrassed right now to tell you I don't know. That's, uh, I mean, I've been told, but mm -hmm. I don't remember. I don't know. If you asked me, if something happened and you said, I need to know what blood, I don't remember. Sure. Uh, it's, it, you know, no, no <laughs> you reason should to be write embarrassed. write it on your hand yeah. or something. <laughs> no reason to be embarrassed. It's uh, it, it, quite a few people Pretty don't common. know. Pretty yeah, common. You know, when, when I was waiting for the surgery, they, they sat me down they said do you have B positive it's very rare I said B positive is rare and they said that you're you, you might take a long time and you may never get a liver because of the kind of blood that you have and uh, it, it all worked out and and but I've thought often about that I don't know if they used the B positive blood I think they probably had to in my case but uh, I mean it's kind of answer, answering the question I had no idea what kind of blood I had and then when they said B positive that sounded so familiar to me. I couldn't imagine that that was rare, and but apparently it is. And I think that brings up another good point is, you know, we don't know exactly what type she received, if she received O negative or if she received all B positive. But again, not only did she need the blood from multiple donors, she needed blood from multiple donors of her same type. So that even kind of limit, that makes right. the number even a little right. bit smaller. And so again, to be able to have, uh, you know, she received well, about 38 pints of blood. Uh, to be able to receive all those pints of blood, uh, you would have need to grab almost a select don number of donors that I hope you guys guys can donate blood and fortunately those people had donated blood and that blood was available. I'm going to ask a question and I don't want you to laugh but <laughs> when you like in your situation when the blood cycles through once the blood comes out of your body and you do a transfusion the blood that comes out is it able to be reused or is it like oil where it gets you know disposed of? Well if you if you're donating blood um, the blood, first of all, is going to go through our labs, and, and we're fortunate here in St. Louis that the American Red Cross operates five national testing laboratories. One of them is right here in the St. Louis area. And so blood donated in this region goes to that testing facility where it's tested. I mentioned it's broken down into components. It's also tested for a variety of, uh, of different illnesses and diseases, including hepatitis, HIV, syphilis, West Nile, things like this, uh, to make sure that the blood is indeed safe to give to somebody in need. Once it's given to somebody in need it is and it's it's been through the testing process it is as, as safe as, as possible as safe as we can determine and as, as safe as the hospitals can determine to give it to somebody in need once it's given to somebody in need 
it becomes a part of their body. Now, uh, Judy had just mentioned a moment ago that she cannot donate blood anymore. And typically, if you have received a blood transfusion, you can't donate blood anymore after that, or at least for uh, an extended period of time. And so to answer your question, can you donate blood that's been donated to you? Typically, the answer is no. What about in a situation where, um, you know, if you're low on blood, you're getting blood put into your body. But as far as I understand, just to make sure I put this into perspective, as far as a transfusion, is it flushing out the old blood and flushing new blood in? I think it is. So yep. as the old blood comes out, can that be reused or does that just get no. disposed of. Once, uh, once the old blood kind of goes out, if you're not donating it um, through, you know, and then the, the donation procedures, um, it, it's very complicated. It's, you know, the, the Red Cross and the knowledgeable staff members we have make it look so easy, but there's a lot of steps that need to be taken in order to safely donate that blood. And if any of those steps are skipped, uh, the blood cannot be used. And that's for not just the safety of the donor, but the safety of the person who could be on the receiving end of that. You know, one of the things that I might comment on, the thing that I was kind of about after I had the surgery, I was, I continued for say a month to lose blood because they explained to me, your body doesn't automatically kick back in and start making blood. So I had to continue to get um, transfusions and, and uh, the care with which the transfusions were given to me was shocking to me because like four people, five people would come into the room and they would, everybody would check the labels and they, they'd kind of repeat the label one to the other and then my name and, and I, I, th I even said to them, every time I get blood it takes five people. But I think that just shows the care and the importance of making sure that it's the right blood and that's the, the right mix. But uh, I was kind of always taken back by then. It's such a delicate process for one but it's the one thing basically in life you really can't live without yeah that's right it is it is you know not to not to make a pun but it is it is the lifeblood it is or the oil in your car it's something that you need to operate and again as, as I've mentioned Judy's mentioned it's not something that we can make in a lab it's the only way we can get it is through people volunteering their time taking time out of their day and you know taking a break from their normal activities to come donate blood they may not know the person on the receiving end. In fact, chances are they're not going to find out who's on the receiving end of it. Uh, something that the American Red Cross has started doing just recently, and I know a lot of our donors really seem to enjoy it, is that uh, after you donate blood with the Red Cross, you'll typically receive something in the mail, uh, maybe four or six weeks out, uh, telling you where your blood went. Now, we can't give you the name of the person it went to, but we can tell you what hospital it was it was, it was was given to. And so you might donate blood, uh, say, here in, in Blackjack or Florissant area, and find out that your blood was used at St. Louis Children's hospital or you might find out that your blood was used at a university hospital in Columbia um, you know you might not know exactly who's on the receiving end but you kind of have an idea of where it's going and I think that also brings home the point that hey my blood is actually being used it's not sitting on a shelf somewhere it's actually being used to help save some lives we when you're on the show we talk a lot about blood donations but the Red Cross does so much more across the gamut for not only the community of St. Louis but the entire nation when you see uh, events and tragedies like what happened in Joplin. Does this become much more of a focused event nationwide where everybody's pulling in from the Red Cross to make this work instead of just a regional or local Certainly, uh, that, that, level. that can be the case. In fact, uh, uh, when we had um, Hurricane Sandy or Superstorm Sandy, excuse me, on the uh, on the East Coast, and we had um, you know massive power outages and massive storms, and, and in, in some cases some injuries as well, it wasn't just blood collected in that area of the country that was used to help those patients. It was blood from all over the country that was shipped over there. And what some people don't realize after a disaster, say like Joplin or say like Superstorm Sandy, uh, it's not necessarily the injuries that are incurred during during that storm, although certainly those can be those can be very traumatic, but it's the days and weeks afterwards. If you can't get through, if the roads are closed or if the power is out, we can't hold blood drives and we can't collect blood or we can't get blood shipped to uh, the people it's needed to. Uh, and so that's why it's so important even after uh, a disaster like that to make sure that uh, other regions of the country can step up and donate blood. And, and so in cases like that, there are instances where we will ship blood across the country or if, and again, you know, heaven forbid this should ever happen, but, but if a disaster were to befall the St. Louis area and uh, in which blood was needed from other parts of the 
the country, the American Red Cross would ensure that that blood was uh, given, uh, given to the St. Louis area and given to those who need it. Judy, as we start to wrap things up here today, uh, I'm going to open up the, the floor to you to uh, kind of directly talk to the people out there who are watching tonight's show about the importance of, hey, it's, it's a simple needle stick, but you're changing so many lives. Well, I am somebody who personally benefited from the American Red Cross and personally saw a change in my life. And I you know, I think shows like this are so important because I think people take it for granted. They think if I need blood, it'll be there. No big deal. But it's a two-way street. There has to be participation on the other side. And I guess the most important thing for people to think about is there is no place else to get it. And so, um, you know, I, I think a show like this is so wonderful. Dan does a great job of, of promoting things uh, for the American Red Cross. But I got to tell you, I think there's lots of people like me. I would not be sitting in this chair right now if the blood had not been available because the liver would not have worked. You know, nobody expected me to have the problems that I had and, and nobody expected for it to, the surgery to go on for three days. But that is, in fact, what happened. And they got me through it and they wouldn't have done it if it hadn't been for the blood. There. When you hear <laughs> stories like that, it's got to make you feel great to go home at night to get up every day and do what you do absolutely you know uh, and I think I've mentioned this last time I was on everybody r regardless of what kind of job you have you're gonna have good days and bad days you're gonna have days where you get home and you say I never want to go back to that office but uh, I I'm very fortunate and, and I think I could speak for uh, all of our volunteers and our staff members at the Red Cross we're very fortunate that we get to uh, do the work that we do because we can see kind of the first-hand effect that uh, that that what the Red Cross is doing and and how it's uh, how it's impacting people but again I couldn't do my job and, and we at the Red Cross couldn't do our jobs if not for those blood donors who are taking time out of their day uh, to do what's best. And it chunked us up into a pie uh, chart basically for people. If you, if you know, is it 20% is it of the people in the United States who donate blood? Is it 50%? Is it 80 percent? Uh, we wish it were 50 percent. We wish it were 80 percent. Um, only about 38 percent are actually eligible to donate blood, and uh, your ad el excuse me, your eligibility could depend on a number of factors. Uh, your age, you have to be at least 17 years old or 16 with parental consent. Um, if you're on certain types of medications, uh, if you've been traveling out of the country, uh, any of those things could could factor in whether you're eligible to donate. So only about 38 percent are eligible to donate, but usually only about 10 percent actually do. In fact, uh, the Red Cross has said before that if of that 38%, if all 38% who are eligible did donate blood, we'd probably be fine. But the, the, the fact is only about 10% actually do donate blood. And that's why we see such a need for blood every day. The need is constant. Well, Dan, we appreciate your time as always. Dan Fox of the American Red Cross. Judy Weidman, fantastic story. Um, Thank you for allowing me to tell it. The true reason why yeah. people should be out there donating. Absolutely. So if you're part of that 38% that actually donates, great. Continue to do it. If you're part of that 38% and you're not donating, get out there and do it. Judy's the living proof that this works. Dan, thanks so much. We appreciate your Thank time. You. And thanks for joining us tonight here on News 20 on GTN. Have a good evening. We'll see you tomorrow night. I'll never forget that moment. That moment? It was a moment that changed my life. I'd been training with my team for months, and now we had been called up for the first time. The real deal. Wildfires were getting dangerously close to homes. At that moment, I got my first taste of just how important the Guard is to my community. See how the Guard can be an important part of your life at NationalGuard.com. Be out there. Be out there. Be out there. Be out there. Time was, kids did what came naturally. Spending free time running barefoot through the grass, wading knee-deep in streams, climbing to the tallest branch. But today, American kids are more likely found texting, watching TV, or gazing at a computer screen. They spend more than seven hours in front of electronic media. Something essential has been lost. Childhood's connection to the natural world. That's why National Wildlife Federation created the Be Out There movement. Kids move indoors causes a host of problems, from obesity to ADHD. But outdoor play can go a long way to improving kids' health. 
body, mind, and spirit. It helps them stay fit, enhances creativity and attention spans, and could even make them better students. Do your part. Be a part of Be Out There. There's a reason why they call it the great outdoors. Learn more at BeOutThere.org. Be Out There! Our day starts very early. We never know exactly when we'll have a full house, but whatever comes up, travel arrangements, birthdays, homecomings, emails back home. We'll do our very best to see they get what they need. It's the very least we can do, considering what they do for us. If you want to make a difference in the life of someone serving our country, if you really want to make a difference, the USO is how it's done. Find out more at USO.org. The USO, until everyone comes home. When Americans volunteer to serve their country, their country promises to take care of them when they come home. For a paralyzed veteran, day-to-day -day living is a major challenge. Calling about calling Paralyzed you know, Veterans of America works to make sure our veterans get all the benefits they were promised from the country they proudly served. A spinal cord injury is an injury for life. And at Paralyzed Veterans, we are their partners for life. Thank you for helping us help America's veterans. Thank you 